Thanks for joining us for another episode of Beyond the Listing, where we discuss the business of real estate outside of the listing environment. I am your host, Jeremy Medor. I'm Danielle Downs. And today we have uh, another good friend of mine um, on, and uh, he will introduce himself later as well. And um, he, we're departing a little bit from our typical podcast mm-hmm. insofar as we're um, sitting down with a non-realtor. Yeah. Um, so this is our first time doing that. So it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. Mm-hmm. So we discussed uh, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of things regarding uh, life and mm-hmm. business. Mm-hmm. And I think it still pertains to what we do on a daily basis here. Um, for our agents, for their clients, yep. um, and it's uh, it's really nice to see that take take shape. Um, and quite frankly, it could actually be the launching point for future episodes uh, under a different um, under a different uh, headline. Awesome. Um, so hopefully, we are able to migrate into a different category of um, of podcasts for next level sure. instead of just Medor photography, while also maintaining the, the Medor photography beyond the listing podcast. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, going to be interesting to see how that grows. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Uh, we've been waiting for this moment. Yeah. And so it's a matter of just um, just, just doing it. Yeah. Just leaning into just it. Just do it. So, um, but uh, we are just past the new year at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I know that uh, for my part, I'm going to be concentrating on making 2024 a looking through a new set of eyes year. Oh, okay. I am trying to be very conscientious with my decisions this year so that I try to try to see how our our decisions, my decisions are going to impact not just the near term but the long term as well. Mm-hmm. Um and um trying to build uh, a better tomorrow um family-wise, yeah. relationship-wise, mm-hmm. business-wise. Um, so I'm really hoping that uh, we can concentrate on some, not necessarily specifically big goals this year, yeah. but different goals sure. this year. Um, and maybe redefining what that looks like as a team um, to ensure that we're growing in a way that uh, is, in fact, to everybody's best interest yeah. and, uh, quite frankly, enjoyment. Yeah, there we go. Enjoyment. Because that's at the end of the day. The, at, at the end of the day, you you have to be able to go home and and say, I enjoyed what I did today. Yeah. And maybe that's not literally every single day. Right. Because who be has that? Downfalls. I mean, right. that's that's. But, I don't want to say unrealistic because I'm sure there are people out there that enjoy every single day. But if you enjoy some part of every single day, that's the that's thing. the main. You have to find main. find that silver lining. Yep. So Absolutely. I mean, I hear from you guys. Uh, you guys being the, the team yeah. frequently that. Um, you know, when you talk about your jobs that people are like, wait, I want to work. There. Uh, yeah. You know, and <laughs> yep. so, so people we, are usually pretty jealous. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you can't sit with us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nanner, nanner, nanner. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful to continue making, um, both of our companies, uh, into a workplace that, um, continues to thrive mm-hmm. and, and, uh, capitalize on, on our talents, our personalities, yeah. um, our, our integration with each other, yep. because it really is about the team here. Absolutely. Um, so I really want to keep that at the forefront of all of our decision making in 2024. Nice. I like that. So without further ado, we're going to get right to our guest. Perfect. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Beyond the Listing. I'm your host, Jeremy Medor, and today I'm sitting with Joshua Page. I'm a husband, father, entrepreneur, also in JP Electric and Son, and starting the movement called Iron Warrior Awaken. It's really nice to talk to you, and thank you for coming into the studio today. Absolutely. Thank you for allowing me. So, um, you've been up to a lot. You've, uh, you've got a lot going on. Yeah. I think it's the only way to be. You gotta have a lot going on. You have a ton going on. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite thing that you've got going on? I think my new thing, Iron Warrior Awaken, um, where I, I really want to, uh, I really want to get down to with men and women to tr- truly find their purpose, uh, live a passion, and become the best the best version of themselves. And it's kind of cliche, um, but 
I, I think there's just so many of us that live in mediocrity that, you know, they just, we're just happy with the job or we're just happy with the income that we're making or, you know, and it's just, I mean, that's perfectly fine if you want to, but I think there's a lot of us, including myself five years ago, five, six years ago that knew in the, in the pit of my stomach that I was like, you know, I'm an electrician, I'm a good contractor. There's more to me though. Like I'm not just an electrician. And I started looking at that because of honestly, because of police officers and firemen where their identity because of their badge is a police officer or mm -hmm. a fireman. And they're always going to be known for that. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, they're not just a police officer or just a fireman. They're a father, a brother, a husband. Like, like they're not just that. There's deeper meaning than that. Exactly. Yeah. And for me, I've always been labeled as the electrician. Sure. Like, oh, you're just an electrician or you just went to trade school. And I'm sure. like, man, there's just something that doesn't sit right inside of me that like, I'm I not just an electrician. Like I'm a great father. I'm a great husband. Like there's more to me. And uh, I think there's a lot of people out there that just, they have that same feeling, but they just don't know what to do with it. Okay. You know? All right. Um, <laughs> what was the turning point for you for that? Was there, um, was there a moment or is there just a short period of time that you can point back to? Well, yeah, for sure. So back in 2018, I think it was 2017, 2018, running the business, doing, you know, doing my thing. The business was always at the top, right? Like, like that's what, it was my baby. That's what I, I, I bred. Uh, I was working so hard. I was, I was going to the office at four o'clock in the morning. I wasn't leaving until nine o'clock at night. Like I put that before everything and literally everything. So it was always my business. And then it was my kids. And then it was my wife, you know, she was at the bottom sure. of bottom of the barrel because the business was supporting us. Like yep. that's, that was the most important thing. And then we had this huge argument at a McDonald's uh, drive through. You can tell where my mindset was back then we were eating McDonald's, but McDonald's drive through and, you know, we were just screaming and yelling at each other. It's like, well, maybe this is why we're not getting our next house together because we're not supposed to be together. And I was like, holy, like, did I just say that? Like, this is, this person's my world. Like, like she was the next person in my life that loved and cared for me just as much as my mom when my mom died. And I just said that. And it was like, no, this, this isn't right, Josh. Like, you didn't mean that but something's not right with you. So it came from a spot where you were, you, where you definitely felt that at that time. Yeah. But that was because you had ended up there in a misguided sense. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was at that time that I was like, all right, something's got to give, like I'm not doing things right. So I started reading books and doing personal development and, and I realized that I had the triangle completely upside down. Like it was the business, then my kids and then my wife. Sure. And I flipped it to now it's my wife, my kids, and my business. Yep. So the business is like the foundation of a house, right? So the entrepreneurship of me, um, the business is is at the base. It's the foundation. That's where it's holding everything up, but it's not the most important. And then it's my kids second. And it might be an unpopular opinion, but my wife is first. And my wife will always be first ever since that paradigm shift because without her, we wouldn't have the kids. We wouldn't have the business. We sure. wouldn't be able to do what we do if we didn't have each other. Yep. And at the end of the day, when our kids are growing up and they're off to college and they have their own families, what's left? It's me and her, yep. you know? And so to me, she's the most important person in my life, then my kids, and then my business. Sure. So if you ask who I am, I'm always going to tell you I'm a husband, a father, and an entrepreneur. In that order. And, and in that order. Yep. And that's that's what the shift was for me back then. Right. So when, when you and I first connected... Um, you were running husband, father, entrepreneur. Yep. Are you still doing that or is Iron Iron Warrior? Iron Warrior Awaken is going to take over that. Okay. And husband, father, entrepreneur is just, that's my label. That That's really who I am and what I believe in. And I think a lot of men do as well. They just haven't really orchestrated in that fashion. Yeah, they haven't identified it and put that together for themselves. Yeah. Yep. I, I So you and I have met prior to this, you know, uh, almost two years ago. Yeah. Um, and I was in a similar spot. Um, to what, to what you went through, um, a little bit less jarring on my end because of the fact that my wife and I, we've put our marriage first for many, many years. Mm -hmm. So we've never really had that McDonald's drive through blowout, uh, which is fantastic to, to actually be able to say that. Although, you know, it's not been without incident. Yeah. Um, but there was definitely a prioritization issue that I went through myself two years ago. And that's what actually ended up causing the move to Maine, to be honest with you. Really? Um, where, we were just juggling too much financial requirement, too much financial responsibility 
for our family dynamic. Mm. My mother-in-law was living with us. Um, we had, uh, three adults and four kids in the household and it was just ma'am. It was just chaos. Wow. Um, and so we needed to streamline and slim down and, and, uh, change things to a more organized, um, sensible way of life. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. why we sold the house in Lunenburg and moved to Maine. Uh, the, the main home that we moved to, we had already owned because, uh, we got it just before COVID. Okay. It was supposed to be a vacation rental. The vacation rental never came to fruition as a result of COVID hitting and uh, uh, short-term rentals being basically banned for the most part, especially up in Maine. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty severe up in Maine, how they locked that down. Hmm. Um, And so as a result, we spent a lot of time up there during COVID and we came to really enjoy that retreat. And so more and more, you know, we, we would go up to Maine and then we'd come home to Massachusetts and it, it felt wrong. It felt wrong to to come back to Massachusetts, not because of Massachusetts is bad or anything like that, just more along the lines of it never really connected as home for me. Interesting. Um, and as a result, by extension, the kids, because they, you know, they saw how I behaved differently in Maine than I did in Massachusetts, because really my heart is in Maine. It's in a slower paced way of life. And it's not necessarily like a, a lower performing way of life. Mm-hmm. I think anybody who knows me knows that I'm, I'm definitely an achiever. Yeah, um, sure. It's just I don't like the hustle and bustle of of constant noise and and uh, chaos. Um, I need stuff, something a little bit more reflective and introspective. And Maine allowed for that to happen. Mm, nice. Um, so it's been good for 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 my soul, and as a result, the the, the family's um, uh, health as a result, which has been fantastic. Phenomenal. Um, no, that's a good decision. But yeah, how long have you guys been married? We've been married uh, twenty years in July. 20 years. Yeah. Wow. 20 years. And I don't know where that time went. It's been incredible. That's uh, awesome. A blink of an eye, man. Blink what, of an are, eye. what are the three things that you can think of that, that, that has made that possible? The 20 years? Yeah. Or the blink of an eye? <laughs> no. Age is the blink of an eye. The 20 yeah. years of marriage. Yeah. 20 years of marriage. What do you, what do you attribute um, that to? Putting patience first. Okay. Putting patience first is definitely a very large part of that. Um, thinking of the other person instead of yourself. Um, so I would say, um, I would say that uh, thoughtfulness would encapsulate that. Sure. Um, and uh, faith, a very large part of our marriage has been founded on an idea that we're not number one. I, we're, 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 our, we're each other's top priority. Yeah. But above that, we, we believe in a creator. We believe in God. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that idea that we're not like top of the shelf, that there's still someone above us. Yeah. Just um, pulling the strings. Yeah, well, pulling the strings or, or just, un, you know, uh, there's, there's a, a faith element there that yeah. we believe that there's a bigger reason for us to be alive and, and, Call it, call it faith, call it religion, call it spirituality, call it whatever you'd like. Yeah, for sure. In the end of the day, it's, it's very similar to what your mindset is in regards to, um, that there's more to life than just this thing yeah, right here. Yeah. And, and if I'm wrong and you know, we, we pass away and there's literally nothing going on afterwards. Oh, well, and so be it. Yeah. So be it. Yeah. And if I'm right, all well, then there was a good point. Yeah, it, right. Absolutely. Um, and it's not even so much a backup plan for me. It's more along the lines of it's my ethos. The way that I enjoy living my life is in support of other human beings around me. Um, I'm a service driven individual. I love to see other people um, be taken care of and, and really make sure that they are um, that they're standing upright, too. So I surround myself with people who are similarly aligned um, and that's what allows Medor Photography and Next Level to exist because we have people here that truly believe in that mantra of being of service to others. Love it. You know, and, and so that's, that's, a, that's a large part of our life as a result, you know, not as a result. That came first. Medor Photography came yeah, second, right? Yeah. But it's the way that we live our life um, because we believe that there's something bigger. Yeah. You know, yeah. and whether it's afterlife or, or here <laughs> in this world right now, um, you know, it's, it could be as simple as just simply being considerate of another driver on the road, right? Mm. Like just little things in life, um, add up to a huge impact outcome. You know, if, if you give grace and patience to others, even when they don't deserve it, which I, I would argue that everybody's deserving of grace and patience. 
um, you're going to have a significant impact on society as a whole. Um, do you, do you ever get angry? Do you ever get, do you, oh yeah. do you does the mass hole come out of you in, in Maine or? Uh, actually the, the, the main hole came out of me in mass, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, honestly, like it, there's, uh, I, I grew up in an environment that, um, was definitely a charged environment, um, mm. with, uh, with a father who, who, uh, had a very difficult time controlling his, his, um, his frustrations and, and his anger. Mm -hmm. Um, and so having been the recipient of that as a child, um, I did my best to try to change that pattern as my own parent, you know, okay. as, as being the parent myself. And that, that came hard. That came hard. I learned a lot of lessons along the way on, on what, you know, on what anger and, and frustration looked like. Do you think it would have made a difference if you had sons? Probably, probably quite frankly. Mm. Um, it's, um, I think that, uh, having four girls mm. and being, being split between the, the patience and anger with four girls is definitely a, a challenge. Yeah. Um, I think that sons might've been a very different outcome. <laughs> I, I don't know. You're, what, you're the only man in the house. Yeah. It's difficult. It's difficult. <laughs> it's yeah. really difficult because, you know, girls, I'm not saying that, that, that boys need the tough love or that they don't. Girls definitely still do. Mm. And the truth of the matter is like, if you coddle them as we're finding out, if you, if you've coddled them, they're going to run into some difficulties in life that they weren't, they weren't prepared to tackle because you haven't given them or required of them. Um, the, uh, the mental ability to, to parse through their own challenges. Yeah. Um, so if, the hardest part for me is, you know, um, because I'm a service person being of service to our daughters yeah. is like my MO, but that comes with its own double-edged sword of oh, sure you're helping them, but are you really? So have you, have you ever read the book, Gary Chapman with the five love languages? Yes. Have you figured out your children's love languages? Oh, because your love language is act of service. Yeah, for sure. But that might not be theirs. Yeah, you're right. You're right. My, my wife and I work off of that quite a bit. Yeah. I've never translated that to the kids. Mm. Yeah. That's a good one. All right. Yeah. Not we did. My, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my wife and I was just talking about our, our own sons and, and, you know, we took guardianship of our niece in 2020 and talking about their love languages. And, and, you know, once you like think about it, you're like, oh yeah, definitely. He's, you know, he's definitely, um, uh, physical touch and, and this one's, you know, gifts. And it's like, all right. Yeah. So once you, once you think about it, you're like, okay, this totally makes sense now. Like I keep doing this and we keep fighting over it. But maybe if I, you know, give him a hug a little bit more or cuddle him a little bit more, our youngest, he's nine and he's definitely physical touch for sure. Because there'll be times that we're sitting at a restaurant and he's got like this big old attitude and doesn't want to order this and that. And then all of a sudden he like goes and like, and hugs you and just wants to stay there. Sure. I'm like, all right. So he wasn't feeling. Yeah. That would be know, our second enough. daughter. Our second daughter, Sarah, <laughs> she's, she's definitely a physical touch and words, uh, probably words of affirmation or split with quality time. Yeah. Um, I know that all of my girls are quality time individuals. I know that for a fact. That's good. Um, that's good. But it's just, that's my MO. I, I, I really enjoy quality time. Connection, well, that's our, you know, what our love thing. language is. We always want to put that out to someone else, but that might not be their right. love language. No, no. You know? So, so what I'm able to confidently say is that that's, that is their love language. I know that for a fact because gotcha. they actively seek it out with me. Good, good. Inviting me to go do things with them, even when I'm not like nearby or, yeah, or, yeah, or yeah. in the mindset. Um, and the hardest part for me is if I'm not in the mindset to do that thing, it's hard to flip that switch on. It is. It is. And so as a dad, how do you overcome something like that? Do you, do you encounter that same thing? Well, there, there's there's times when my 14 year old would be like, "Oh, Dad, can you get me a cup? Oh, Dad, can you get this?" And I'm like, "Is he acts of service or is he just being a lazy <laughs> ass?" <laughs> so I'm like, "Do I deny the act of service or do I be a dad? Uh, is he gonna take advantage of me?" I'm like, "All right, here's yeah. a damn cup." <laughs> yeah, isn't it? It's it's frustrating that you yeah. have to like even parse through that in your brain sometimes. Yeah, right. No, it is, but. It's true though. Yeah. Um, oh, for sure. But I think that the, the net outcome of that is extremely important mm. because if you're thinking critically like that, and maybe sometimes it's just a, 
request for a cup, right? Yeah. But if you're thinking critically like that, you're living consciously and you're not just going through the motions. You're not going off of programming. Yeah, you know, for you, sure. You asked on Facebook at, at New Year, you asked the question of, uh, you know, what are you, what are you not bringing into 2024? Mm. And my answer to that uh, was uh, my old self and my old programming. And you asked me to expand on that. And I'm in the process. And then you said one hour podcast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we have a, we have a hour podcast ahead of us, Josh. <laughs> so um, really what it comes down to is that programming that you, that you're given growing up through your environment. You know, you had a, you had a really rocky start yourself. Mm, mm. Um, and I think that, I think all in our own ways, we have our own rocky starts. And even though somebody's childhood might seem easy, if I'm, if I'm carving out a path for my girls to make it easy for them, that's actually creating a rocky start for them because yes. when they go off on their own, they're going to have a hell of a time trying to figure out what's what. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think that rocky start is a very subjective term, right? But we all have our bumps and um, it's, it's the bumps that we overcome and some, actually sometimes the failures that we encounter that make us who we are and whether or not we seek to uh, learn from those and grow beyond them. Mm. That is really what tests the metal of an individual. Um, but in order to do that successfully, I think you need to throw away the programming and assume the responsibility for yourself by yourself um, and, and live for the right reason. Yeah. I think that, I think that is, is part of anyone that's consciously looking for growth in themselves is going to do it. But, it, but like I said, in the beginning of the mediocrity, the people that live in the, the mediocre lives that they they, they aren't going to do that work. No. It, it's too much work. They, they haven't even put forth that they're, they're programmed to be like their mom or dad, or, you know, th this is the way it's always been. So this is how I grew up. This is how you're going to grow up. And it's like those people is what we need to work on. You know, you, you're, you're going through the growth. You, you understand it. It's a, it's a transformation. It's a journey, but a lot of people are just like, well, that's just all I know. You know, this is the way right. it is. And you no, know, my dad yelled at me, so I'm going to yell or my dad spanked me. So I'm going to spank. It's like, no, you, you, we can't do that. You know? And, and I, I, I unfortunately see a lot of myself and my dad where, you know, he doesn't have a lot of friends. I don't really have a lot of per se friends. I've got a lot of close acquaintances. Sure. Um, but it, you know, for me, it's, I, I'm just always so busy and just always family 100% driven and then success driven. And I just want to continuously, you know, move up the ladder. Um, he's, you know, all set doing his own thing, but there are times that I'm like, okay, you know, I know I grew up this way, Josh, but this isn't the way that you're going to treat your sons or the way that we're going to do things. Maybe the way that you grew up is not always the correct way. Yes, it was a struggle. Yes, it was hard times. Not that I want my kids to go through hard times, but they do need to struggle. They do need to, they do need to have loss. They do need to have failures. You know, I coach all their sports and there's times that we lose games and, you know, they're upset and crying. And I'm like, listen, this is the way it is. It's like, part of life. Like we're, we're not going to win every game and you're not going to win every time at life. Like it's just part of it. We have to, it's not what we go through. It's, it's how we react to it. Yep. You know, we, and what we, you learn from the experience. Exactly. You know, okay, we got to train differently or we got to do different layups yep. or we got to run harder, or whatever it is. And we become better the next time, yep. you know, my wife and I call it the Barbie effect. <laughs> Um, so, so growing up, the girls were watching obviously, uh, children's programming and a large, a large part of the children's programming. And this is, this is something that needs to change in my opinion, um, is success on the first try. Um, in a lot of kids cartoons, there is this mantra of, you know, this, this child from nowhere comes into an out of, you know, in, in, into a new town and automatically hits, you know, this rough patch because she's the new girl or maybe she's the outcast or whatever. Hey, right, fine, whatever. And then she goes to compete against the popular person and she wins right away. Yeah. And that's a problem because that mm. just looks like adversity to win in one episode. That's a, un, that's an exceptionally unrealistic arc. True. For anybody to Very encounter. Very true. And that's... I know that on the surface, it's like, dude, it's just a kid's show. Guess who's watching it? Yeah. The yeah. people that are the most impressionable and it's going to stick with them. And they might not remember the exact show, but their brain will have been programmed that success should come just because they tried once. Mm. You really need to go through the story arc in order to get to the success. Yeah. And a lot of times the people that don't end up being successful in their life, whether it be 
relationships or, 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 or money or, you know, uh, whatever pursuit they encounter. It's just really a matter of who tried more. Mm. It's not necessarily who's better at it. I agree. Because we all know, you know, hard work trumps talent when talent refuses to work. Yes. And I'm definitely, I'm definitely the a, a poster child for that because I'm not a fantastic photographer. And I know that this is probably going to be like, well, dude, you run a photography company. Yeah, we don't want to hire you. <laughs> we do phenomenal photography. Yeah. There are people that are better than, than me, than, than, than any of my team. There are people that are better. Granted, they're like international photographers that you can't secure yeah. and hire, right? So it's all yeah, about- National Geographic doesn't count. Exactly, yeah. right? You know, so it's, it's, it's just a matter of what the market is that you're talking about, you know? So it really depends on, on what the, the topic that we're, you know, that we're covering as far as the value of our photography, right? But the point is that um, I encountered so many challenges when I first started doing real estate photography. Um, and there was a lot of depressing moments where you're just like, well, that didn't work. And you just hit your head up against the wall over and over again because I was carving a path in an industry that hadn't yet existed when I mm. first started. Like real estate photography was literally just starting to form 11 years ago when I began. Yeah, you would have been easier doing headshots for the rest of your life or working at JCPenney. I hated it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was doing weddings, I was doing headshots, families, stuff like that. And it just wasn't me because I didn't really get a chance to connect with people nearly as intimately as I wanted to. Not that real estate allowed for that to occur. Connecting with agents was what I started doing. Mm. And having the adult one-on-one -on -one conversations in the homes was in fact what lit me up. And I found that the real estate photography was actually just the vessel in which I Very true. delivered what my content was. Yeah. But the connections that I was forming with realtors at the time were galvanizing these relationships and growing a business. Yeah, that's you know? that's what you're after. Yeah. And yeah. that's and that's what woke me up. But it there's so many pitfalls. So many pitfalls. Mm. And I'm sure mm. that you've encountered Oh yeah, for them, sure. You know, countless times in your own business. I don't know. We got a new one coming out. That's why I want to talk about your book. What does your mommy do? Is uh, I just approved the last bit of illustrations. I got two more to change. So what's this beginning of January? Hopefully by March it should be coming out. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think that'll be it. So we'll have a what does your daddy do? What does your mommy do for electricians? And then... Um, is it specifically for electricians or tradespeople in general? So this this new, this new one's just electricians. So what does your daddy do is just electricians. Um, what does your mommy do is always... <clears throat> excuse me, was always going to be built. And I really wanted it to be like electricians, carpenters, welders, all of that. Yep. But to be honest, writing a children's book is extremely expensive. And um, why? It, just the cost behind it all okay. between publishing it and, and the illustration and printing it and, and marketing. It was very, very expensive for the first one. The second one's not any different. Okay. Um, and the book didn't do as well as I thought it would. Okay. Um, so we'll probably stop at those two, but I've got another three books that I, I want to write, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. I don't know. I, I really need to start blocking out some time because, um, it's one of those things that it's in me to write these books. And, um, I think a big part of my life is I don't want to live life with regret. And, uh, there's parts of my life that I regret. I, I've, I've gone through therapy and, you know, uh, I've, I've gone, th I've gotten over it, but there's parts of my life that I've learned that I, I don't want to live life of regret because of things that, that happened with my mom, sure. you know, like, like one of the things, you know, I can talk about, I probably never talked about it on, you know, other than outside of a therapist's office was, um, I, I regretted, you know, being 13 years old and, and not holding my mom's hand, right. You know, um, mom was dying of cancer. She was bald. I was embarrassed. Um, and that's just one of those things that I've always carried with me. I'm getting teary eyed, but it's just one of those things I've always carried with me as an adult that, you know, Josh, you should have held your mom's hand. I get it. And at 13 years old, I just didn't know any better, you sure. know? And, um, I just don't want to live life regret with regret. And, um, these three books, well, one of them's kind of a tongue in cheek, funny thing with contracting, but, um, the other two, I, I really want to, I really want to get out of me. And, and one of them's called the power of purpose. Yeah. And uh, the other one's called The Day I Lost My Smile. And uh, those two books I, I really need to get out into the world this year and get written. The um, Day I Lost My Smile. 
Yeah. I would want to read that <laughs> just based off of the title. Yeah. So I, I don't want to go too into detail because it's not written yet, sure. but it's, it's, um, I think it's going to be a wake up call for parents, um, to be as present as you can with your children. Yep. And uh, power of purpose, obviously, that that's something that, you know, is, is meaningful to me because I didn't truly have a purpose, I don't think, until that big wake up call back in 2017, 2018, where yep. I, I figured out I'm a husband, father, entrepreneur, like that's sure. who I am. That's my purpose in life. And um, so to me, that that book would be huge. And somebody was asking me a couple of weeks ago, they said, Josh, it seems like uh, legacy is a big thing for you. And I said, yeah. And they said, what does legacy truly mean for you? And I didn't have an answer. And I thought about it and thought about it and thought about it. And I, I you know, I was thinking about, you know, generational wealth. Okay, that's a legacy. I was thinking about um, Watkins. I don't know if you know Watkins. I can't think of his first name right now. But he's big in Haywood Hospital. He was big in Cushing Academy in Ashburnham. Uh, he was the adopted grandson of the uh, founder of Simplex. Okay. And um, so he's donated a ton of money to Cushing Academy, a ton of money to okay. Haywood. There's a couple buildings named after him. Yep. But to me, so he's, he's left a legacy for sure. But one of those, one day those buildings will be torn down or eventually. Replaced, or or, or replace replaced. the name of. Yeah. <clears throat> so to me, that, le that legacy goes away. It's temporary. Even if it lasted 50, 60 years. Generational wealth will only last so long. So what... Does All legacy has to do is get misspent by somebody? <laughs> true. So, what does legacy truly mean for me? And I think it all boils down to leadership. Yep. Is I am leading my life the way that I should and the way that is meant best for me. And I want my children to understand that and to see it and and follow suit. And and being the leader for them, for my family, for my community, that other people will also see it and be like, you know what? Yeah, I, I want to do that as well. Like doing the right thing when no one's watching, yeah, you know, is is very big for me. And there there was a you know a time, I think it was two years ago. It was the opening night of the Worcester Railers, and we were leaving. We were all going to the parking garage. And all of a sudden, I see like a scuffle of people out on the street next to the parking garage. People are screaming. And I literally took one look to my right and I ran across six lanes of traffic. I almost got hit by a guy that, that didn't see me coming, ran over it. And it was a bunch of kids that were fighting a homeless guy and he was on the ground, bloody and whatever else. So meanwhile, as I was running those six lanes of traffic, I'm calling 911, making sure that they were on their way. We broke up the fight. Um, you know, the guy ended up, he was belligerently drunk and ended up fighting EMS when they got there. But besides the fact, to me... I didn't care about anything else at that moment other than trying to serve and 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 to be a leader in that situation sure. when everyone else just had their cell phones up. Yep. All everyone's doing is just recording and yep. watching. And my kids watched that. Yeah. And they saw That's going to stick with them. The leader yep. do what was right when nobody else was doing it. Yep. And to me that's the legacy I'm going to leave. It's not millions of dollars. It's not, you know, a building named after me yet. <laughs> but to me it's the legacy is leadership. Sure. You know, so that's, to me, that's what I want to leave in those kids. And that was kind of one of the reasons why, not the main reason, but another big reason why I wanted to write the children's book is, you know, mom died when, I, when she was 37. I'm 39. So I passed her point of living on this earth, but it's always at the back of my mind. And I didn't want to leave this earth without leaving something behind. Okay. And so at least my kids will be able to show their kids and, you know, it, the book will stay, you know, that that's a legacy too. I mean, the book's not going to go away no matter if it became a New York best times or, you know, big seller or whatever else, it's still there and it's in print. And for me, that was, a, uh, it meant a lot for me to write that book. Sure. You I know? can, I can respect that. I, I understand what you're saying. Um, frequently, frequently we encounter, Oh, actually just this past storm, uh, we encountered, in one day, I encountered three different vehicles that had gone off the road, you know, and each one of them I stopped at just to make sure that everybody was yeah. all set, you know. Um, and my kids were in the car with me, you know. It, it was on Sunday. We were just coming home from church. We yeah. went to church even though it was, like, ridiculously yeah, snowy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and got snow tires. Um, and uh, we stopped at each one of the vehicles. And just that act alone is enough for the kids to take notice because – they're going to see that that's the right thing to do. Exactly. You know, and maybe 
they themselves may not do it, but they'd expect that maybe of their husband. Mm. Right. Love it. Um, and I'm hoping to model what a father figure and what a, what a husband figure looks like for our four girls. Yes. So that they understand what respect looks like, what responsibility looks like. Um, and what shoulder and burdens looks like, yes, you know, and, and that's the leadership element. Right. Um, and I don't, I don't generally define that as leadership, uh, more of a role model of sorts, you mm-hmm. know, and I think that, um, I think that we all need a role model. And if we don't have one, be that one mm. for others. Um, and I, I frequently tell our, our teenagers this, I'm like, Hey guys, you know, in your high school, who, who do you look at and identify and say, that person's got it together? Yeah. And, you know, they have one or two that they look at. Their high school is very small. There's only like 35 kids wow. all together. It's a small Christian school. Um, and uh, then I said, all right, how about the guys? Crickets. Hmm. Half the, half the high school is guys. And they didn't have an answer for they that. Have, they don't have a role model or th- there's no men that they, they look no up as a role model? There's no men in there that stand out to them. Hmm. And so then I asked the next question of, do they just not stand out to you or do they not stand out to each other? And they've heard directly from male classmates how lonely these guys feel. And so recently I've had conversations with the principal and said, hey, I'd like to volunteer That's good. at your school. Because these guys need a man in there. They need someone to look up you know, to. They have a, there's a couple male teachers, but they're, they're older and they're in the grandkids phase. Um, and I think that as a result of their age, the younger generation may not see them as identifiable. Yeah, no way. You know what I mean? Um, and so not, not to say that I'm young, you know, I'm 43 this year, but, um, having teenagers their age, I can definitely connect with them better than a grandparent would. Absolutely. You know? Um, So I'm hoping to help bridge that gap. Um, And so those are the things that I'm doing in my own life to try to bring a bit of what you're caught, what Mm. what you look at as legacy, you know? Um, And I'm not consciously doing it for purposes of legacy. I've never really kind of thought about that. Yeah. Just more along the lines of bettering the future is kind of how, how I'm hoping for things to turn out. Who's who's your role model? I don't have one. Uh, that's not true. That's not true. Since moving to Maine, I do have one. Okay. I do have one. Um, he's my buddy, Dan. And uh, I know that his uh, wife, Corrine, is going to listen to this episode. <laughs> and uh, she's going to probably have a tear in her eye. And um, I'm anxious to have her feedback on that, Corrine. Um, that's cool. But uh, Corrine is actually a life coach. Um, that's what she does. Okay. Um, and she and I have connected exceptionally well with these sort of inspired conversations. Um, and Dan and Corrine went through something similar, like your McDonald's yeah. uh, takeout line. Um, and uh, they've been through, they've been to hell and back, to be honest with you, from, mm. from, a, from a marriage standpoint, from a job standpoint. Um, Dan's an ex-Marine, uh, ex-prison guard. Um had every reason to be the most hardened individual that you could possibly come across. Yeah. And he's a big teddy bear. He's a softy and it's phenomenal. He probably wouldn't like for you to say that. Oh no, he would. He would. No, he's gotten, he's, he's a, he's a strong, strong man, very resilient, strong man. Yeah. Um, but he has a heart of gold. Nice. And, uh, he's gotten me involved in uh, a men's group up in Maine called loving to last and living to last is all about, teaching the next generation, the cool. legacy cool. aspect of things. And it's about the trades specifically. And Living to Last is an organization very similar to Habitat for Humanity, okay. except on a local level. And it fills the gap of need that exists between absolute poverty yep. and being able to support yourself. Um, and because there's a lot of government programs out there, but you're on a wait list, yeah. right? Yeah. Like um, up in Maine, they have, they have a program called Community Concepts. And I don't know if that's a Massachusetts thing or not, but uh, community concepts is essentially meant for um, need-based individuals, primarily aimed at uh, elderly and social security income individuals, okay. disability and things of that nature, um, 
to help support their living environment, whether it be like a hot water tank that needs replacing or mm. roof that's leaking or whatever. But they are so backed up, it's not even funny. Wow. Uh, and they're relying on independent contractors to take really poorly paying jobs. And so as a result, you get you get what you pay for. Yeah, right? it's tough. And so as a result, you get uh, some a lot of Band-Aids and bubble gum and duct tape solutions. Mm. And so we, uh, the organization Living to Last, gets together uh, once per month uh, on a Saturday and we do home repair jobs at no charge to the, to the home. That's awesome. And so it's donated materials through, uh, a, a, um, through various sources. Cause a lot of the guys that, in, uh, that are involved in it are contractors themselves. Gotcha. So they have leftovers from jobs yeah. and stuff like that. They just kind of put it into the pool. And then of course we survive on contributions and, yeah. um, through That's Medora amazing. photography, we're able to, you know, uh, have a, uh, have a contribution to them and stuff yeah. like that. So, um, it's, but it's really beneficial because <clears throat> what we're doing is we're growing a brotherhood of men that um, exist for the sole purpose of uh, camaraderie, yeah. um, companionship, uh, connection. And then, of course, on the job, we're learning a lot of skills in the process. Yeah. I grew up in a contractor's household. I know how to do a lot of home DIY stuff, but I never really like... Sorry, Dad. I never really paid attention a heck of a <laughs> lot, you know? I mean, I, I, I just didn't, you yeah. know? We did roofing, siding, windows, whatever... And I was just the guy holding the other end of the, uh, of the Dubai for, yeah, you know, and yelled at cause you dropped the flashlight. Three exactly. Times. <laughs> exactly. You know? And so at that point you're not observing like how it's done. Yeah. You're just, you know, trying to stay awake and not yawn. Yeah. Um, and so here I am as, as an adult hoping to acquire more of these skills and I'm, I'm, I'm able to do that through the, That's through, the awesome. uh, through the organization. So it's really awesome. And, and, and I'm having a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing it, but Dan, who was a role model for yeah. me, he got me involved in it. And, uh, honestly it's, hands down the best relationship outside of marrying my wife that I've ever formulated. Good for you. So I want to backtrack a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm taking control of this podcast. Please. Now. What, what is your purpose in life? You're interviewing me now. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's fine. I take control. No, that's fine. That's fine. My purpose in life. <laughs> My purpose in life is to be to be a shining example of what you can be as an individual, um, whether it be with children or employees or even a spouse. To be remembered as someone who made a difference. Mm. That would be my purpose in life. I love it. How do you want to make a difference in just, you know, doing what you're doing with the men's group or making a difference of in, hiring employees or in the normal every day? Yeah. In the normal every day, Josh, <clears throat> like seriously, I think that a lot of people, when they talk about making a difference or they think about making a difference and how it applies to them, they overcomplicate it. Agreed. People are like, Oh, I want to no shade here. I want to write a book, yeah. right? Or I want to do a podcast or I want to even go bigger than that. I want to make a company. All right, well, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with those things. Yes. But for a lot of people, that's out of reach. For sure. Right? They don't know the first thing about getting involved in that or they're too timid to do that. That's okay. Don't do it. Yeah. Start smaller. Do the one thing that you're capable of doing today that makes a difference for tomorrow. Yeah. And then keep doing that thing. That's all it takes to make a difference. That's all it takes. I think I, I don't, I'm going to probably mess it up, but Tony Robbins has a saying, something like, you know, people overestimate what they can get done in a day, but underestimate what they can get done in a year or might be backwards. But probably the know, opposite. Yeah. Probably the opposite. Yeah. Because overestimating what you can do in a year is easy. Yeah. 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 But underestimating what you can do in yeah. a day, there's a massive amount of things that you can do today yeah. that makes such an effective difference for tomorrow. And people, don't know and, or they or they're, they don't believe it. Belief is, belief is a big thing. It is. Belief is, is for sure a big thing. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 it all starts. I mean, if you, if you read Andrew Carnegie or Napoleon Hill or any of that, everything starts as imagination. I mean, everything in this room started in someone's mind. Yep. Everything yep. down to how to make this Celsius can, yep. you know, it all started in someone's mind. 
And I think as adults, we, we start to lose our ability, of, not even ability, imagination. We just, we just don't choose to use it anymore. You know, we don't, we don't take the time to think. Is that to, the day that you lost your smile? Um, no, the day I lost my smile was a long time ago. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, I, <clears throat> there's been multiple studies shown, um, showing that um, children who are graded for imaginative performance in kindergarten to generally lose the majority of it by fifth grade. Mm, um, wow. Wow. And it's a lot younger than I thought. A lot younger. Yeah. Right. And it's a sobering thing because the thing about it is, I mean, I don't want to get on too, too much of a soapbox or a tangent, but our education system oh, yeah. is set up such where we create line workers. Yeah. You know, and while that might be for the good of society as it currently stands, I'm not sure that it actually betters society because we do in fact lose the artistry, the absolutely the ingenuities, the innovators. That's why um, they're entrepreneurs are only 1%. I mean, no, nobody else wants to put forth the, the, the attention and the energy and everything else except for the crazy. You know, we are the crazy. It you is know? crazy. I mean, we are, we, 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 we put so much out there. When I, when I started my electrical company, I, I had three weeks paid vacation. I had full health insurance. I was making good money. Um, you know, I had no van, but, you know, we were on big jobs. I had um, a one-year-old. We had a mortgage. And I was like, hey, Lindsay, uh-huh. um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about starting. It wasn't even electrical. It was this infrared business. And she's like, um, okay. That's right. You're doing the clear stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, when I started, when I, I literally quit all that to go to this infrared company that I started. And I had no clue. You know, I had no clue what I was doing, but I, I, I had a dream. I wanted to, you know, I could, I, I wanted to get out there and do it. I was, you know, building a website with, it was called homestead.com back then. I was working on websites and Vistaprint for business cards. And, you know, I was, we got pulled over by a, um, a Mass State Police because we had a, a magnet on the side of our Explorer and we didn't have commercial plates. And he said we'd end up in Walpole State Prison. <laughs> Son of a gun. You know, uh, I've never you know. been one, I've never once been pulled over. Oh, I, have, yeah. I have a logo on my vehicle and I've never had a commercial plate. And I've been driving a logoed vehicle for about eight well, years. Well, we, we were the lucky one. I, I had a uh, I had a uh, a letter from the um, U.S. General Postmaster, or whatever, because I went through Townsend and Pepperell and Lunenburg and put advertisements into people's mailboxes. But oh, I didn't. <laughs> that's a big no no. That's a big no no. You do I didn't not know touch you could mailboxes. not do that. <laughs> it, is, it is actually a crime. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't realize that, right. but, uh, but you learn stuff, but you learn it, you yeah. know? And it was like, you know, there was a lot of times that we, you know, we were, we were struggling. Yeah. I mean, we were struggling hard and I can identify, I, you know, I had a customer one time cause I went from infrared to handyman. I'll never forget. And he said, he said, man, you, you know, you're running an AFAB company, huh? Yeah. I was like, anything for a buck. What, what the hell is AFAB? Yeah. He's like, yeah, anything for a buck. Yeah. And I, I took so much offense to that. Sure. Sure. I was like, no, I'm not. But then I really took a look back and I was like, you know what, Josh, you are, you are. because you wanted to do infrared. Now you're dusting vents and sure. you're getting poison ivy and you're fixing fences. I'm yep. like, wow, you need to like, yep. you know, figure out what you're doing. You were here. telling me once about the the clean out business. That yeah. You're doing for yeah. A while for and closures. And so, uh, but I get you know. it. I get it. I mean, my, my origin story is not too much different from you as far as becoming self-employed. You know, uh, we had saved up enough to put a down payment on a house. Um, and I was so miserable with my job. It wasn't even funny. It was a ball and chain around me is what yeah. it was. Um, and I realized that spending that money as a down payment, as we had earmarked it, would just basically subscribe me to a life of the same. You know, why would I want that? And so um, I came home one day and, and legit, like um, I, I had some real rock bottom moments at that job. Um, there was multiple times I'd come home like completely beside myself crying and just, just, I, I was abused, you know? Mm. And, and, um, so I came home one day and I looked at Jen and I said, uh, I quit my job today. Wow. And I hadn't, I wanted oh. to see what her off the cuff response was. And she goes, Oh, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Wow. <laughs> you know, she goes, well, she goes, I know that you've been unhappy there. And I'm like, Okay. Well, to be honest, I haven't, but I needed to know what your response was. And so the next day I did, and I had put my month, one, my one month notice in and November 1st of 2012 
is when my last, well, my first day of self-employment was. Wow. And uh, the agreement was that, you know, we had this reserve money. And then if it reached a specific threshold, I'd go out looking for another job because gotcha. we weren't, we weren't going to just go down to zero. And we, I went out. So you had a, a plan B. I had, yeah. So I, th- that was problem number one. <laughs> I should have had a plan B. I should have had a plan <laughs> Gotta B. Got to burn those ships. But the thing about it is that I hadn't discovered real estate photography at that point. Yeah. Um, I was doing weddings on a part-time basis and the intention was to have it be a full-time basis. Um, and I didn't really do the math, um, on when I put my notice in, I put it in, in October and frankly, I mean, like it was such a stupid move because weddings, yeah, they don't happen in the winter, <laughs> That's true. you know, and yeah. you get some contracts and stuff like that. So down payments and stuff, but that's pretty much it, you know? Yeah. So it was a really ill-timed notice. I should have waited you know, February, March and done it then maybe even January, whatever. You right. might not have done it by then. That's exactly it. You know? I had to strike. Right. Yeah. And so I did that. And so I went out and I did a couple of interviews and I even got a job offer, but on the way home from that, a job offer, um, my heart was like just thumping out of my chest telling me this isn't what you want. Jeremy. Yeah. Stop yeah. doing this, that kind of yeah. thing. And so I got home and I'm like, I, I can't do it. I said, can I just get like another two weeks? And sure enough, what happened? I got a bunch of wedding uh, inquiries. I landed some contracts. I started getting involved in real estate. I hadn't known it, but winter market for real estate is like, it's a big deal. Like it's it's crickets compared to what our busy times of the year are. Gotcha. You know? So for every one job that we do during December, January, or February, we do like five or six in wow. May or June, wow. right? And so the ratio is astronomically horrible. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just a result of New England's mantra of don't sell during the winter, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And which is, whoever's watching, this has got to stop. Um, so <laughs> Man's got to eat. <laughs> it's not even that. It's that it's, it's not healthy. The ebb and flow is not healthy for the market as a whole. Um, because what ends up happening is the vendors all get flooded at the same time. That's inspectors, that's mortgage yeah. loan officers, yeah. photographers, anyone across the spectrum, even people that are called in for repairs, yep. they get flooded at the same time of the year. True. Um, and if you're in commercial, it probably offsets that quite a bit just simply because you have that regularity of work or, or yeah. maybe there's a subscription model or a retainer kind of thing. But in residential, it's feast or famine. Yeah. yeah. And when it feasts, it feasts to the point where you're drinking out of a fire hose. You know, so I have to I have to try to work with our company um, dynamics so that we have enough employees that are skilled, well-trained, year-round employees. Mm. But then what? You have no work for them in December, January, yeah. you know? And so, so we, we, we struggle during those months, but we juggle. Yeah. And we always work on new projects at that time yeah. so that way we can kind of launch into the next year yeah. and stuff, which, yeah. is, That's great. which is a good routine, but... It's, um, it, it was hairy at first, really hairy. How many employees do you have now? Well, we have 13. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So 11, 11 years, right? Uh, 11 years, 13 yep. employees. Yeah. So our plan for this year, um, I'm actually having a team meeting this afternoon. I'm going to talk, I'm going to jump the shark a little bit here. Um, our plan this year is to, uh, to hire another two, maybe three. Um, we have a part-time employee that we're actually looking at getting on board that handles uh, some of our social media work Yeah. Um, because we're a little bit overwhelmed in that department. Social media management is actually very time consuming. Mm. Um, and so we're going to be looking for somebody in that plus another two photographers. Is nice. At, nice. So. But think about, think about the impact that you have made, you know, in the communities, in, in every one of your employees lives with, with everything because of that one decision that you made to test out your wife on day one and then do it on day two, <laughs> Yep. you know, and you might not have made that same decision if you waited till March, April. I may that, not have, you know, you know winds could have changed, shifted. Yeah. Um, a, a number of things could have happened, you know, um, it all, you know, when we get slow, we usually get slow February, March, April. And I always just remind myself, I'm like, Josh, it only takes one phone call, one email. That's it. That could just change you know, our, 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 exactly yeah. for the, for the next two months, all it's going to take is one big job or one, you know, email or one big estimate or something, you know, and it always comes. But for me, I think, I think, you know, everything happens for a reason, but I, I, I'm also a big believer in, in God gives us these opportunities, right. And if he gives it to you specifically, and then if you don't take that, because you're too afraid mm-hmm. or you don't want to test it, mm-hmm. that's fine. Mm-hmm. He's going to give it to the next one. He will. So 
in that two weeks, when you asked for the two weeks, he was testing you. He's like, man, are you going to be man enough to do this? Are you going to be able to do it? Yep. And you're like, all right, I just need two more weeks. And he's like, all right, here we go. Yep. Then take it. Yep. You know, and I, I'm a big believer in that. And I've seen that happen time and time and time again in my life where, you know, anything new I've started or any project, I'm like, ah, you know, the resistance sets in, you know, even getting started on Iron Warrior Awaken, everything's telling me, Josh, you, you know, you're an electrical contractor, you're an electrician, you don't have time for this, you shouldn't be doing this, you should be focusing on other things. And it's like, no, like I you can think, feel it. You think you know? too big to be just an electrician. Yeah. You just do. Yeah. And and if you if you keep feeling pulled back to that mold, you need to do something bigger to separate yourself from it permanently. Absolutely. Um, and that's, that's probably the hardest part. Yeah. So like, it's very easy for me to be like, Oh, you know, I've literally heard the words, Jeremy, you just push a button for a living, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> and, and what's worse is that it came from a family member. It's a lot of times though. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of times. Um, right. But like, it's that, it's that whole adage of, of, um, you know, somebody coming to, to fix a, a ship's engine and knowing exactly where to strike the engine to get it starting again, you know, and, yes. and, and charging, you know, what, what people consider to be an astronomical figure for it. But the truth of the matter is the knowledge on how to get it started is in, a, is in actuality what you're paying for. You're paying yeah. for all those years of, of uh, professionalism. And, and, but and nobody, nobody understands that. And I don't think that's in any, in anything that you, you, that people hire, they only care about the end result. They don't care about all that training, all that time, all like, Generally, where's my no. pictures? You know, that, that, or Correct. for us, do the recess lights work? Like, yep. I don't care what you had to do to put them in. Like, yep. do they work? Great. Yep. Awesome. Here's that's, your check. See you later. But that's the difference between the transaction and the relationship. Very true. Right. And Very so true. I've, I've, I would say that I'm officially out of the transactional mindset. Good. And Good. into 100% relational mindset, which Good. is why we have these podcasts. Yeah. So that I can dig deeper with people into what mindset they approach their work with mm. and approach their life with. And I've been looking forward to this podcast <laughs> with you because I knew that there would be some hard truths, you know, coming out in the yeah. process. Well, I, I give it to you because I think you've, you've blazed a trail where, where nobody else would have really gone. I mean, to, to just do real estate, I know you do other things too, but your, your primary is, is real estate. Yep. And, you know, I equate that, you know, me as an electrician, that's like saying, Hey, you know what? We only do electrical panels. Like we're only going to swap your electrical right. panel. I'm not doing recessed lights. We're not doing ceiling fans. We're not doing fire alarm. We're not doing commercial. We're just doing electrical panels. Sure. And that takes a lot of gut. You know, that, that does because, I don't know for us how that would work. You know, like I'm going to say no to 95% of the people. Right. And I'm just going to do electrical panels. Yep. But for you, you're like, you know what? This is it. Like we're going into real estate. I don't want to do weddings. I don't want to do headshots anymore. I don't want to do this. Like we're just going to focus on real estate. Yep. But the pictures that you take and the clients that you have and what I see online and social media, I mean, it's just phenomenal. I mean, there's no way you're not going to sell this house faster without these pictures. Right. There's just no way. Right. So that's know? why we aimed at the specialty because um, if we muddied the waters by doing, you know, anything for a buck, yeah. right? If we, if we did the AFAB approach, um, which I see a lot. So when people come apply to our company, of course I ask for a portfolio yeah. and they usually send along their self-employed website. And a lot of the, a lot of the times it's like, yep, I'll do everything from newborns to, Weddings to seniors to real estate to landscape to everything. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that per se from a well-roundedness standpoint, yeah. especially for somebody who has really groomed themselves as a photographer. It really shows how flexible they, they can be. The question is whether or not they're willing to approach the point of diminishing returns on learning the speciality of real estate. Mm. And because you can't just go in and just rapid fire. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to approach it from a very specific mindset in order to achieve the photos that you're looking for. So similarly to electrical panels, right. Being your yeah. case in point, um, you better be the best damn electrical panel installer out yeah. there. Oh, for sure. Make it like your bread and butter. Yeah. Right. And that's what we, otherwise you're just going to so, get run over. You really are. Yeah, you really are. And so you have to really gauge the market to see whether or not there's enough um, share there. And like I said before, we got on board uh, at a time that it wasn't really a, it wasn't really a thing. Mm. You know, when I first started, it was in Andover, North Andover. And um, I took a cursory glance at MLS and I'm like, Hey, you know, 
how many of these houses that are on an MLS in the Merrimack Valley have been professionally photographed? And it was like 25% at most. Wow. At most. Wow. And so I kind of did some market research on that. And I'm like, well, there's plenty of room to grow. Yeah. You know, and if it was like already at 75%, I'd be like, all right, this already kind of starting to get saturated. Um, but within no time at all, moving out to Central Mass, it was wildfire. And we were just perfectly poised to do it. Yeah. You know, so it is, it is about being in the right place at the right time, but having the right mindset to do it at the yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that's what brought us here. Um, but similarly, Next Level, which is our second company, mm. um, the purpose of Next Level, the sole purpose of Next Level is to move outside of real estate and specialize in storytelling and creating long-term partnerships and relationships with business owners so that we can communicate their origin stories, their why their mm. purpose um, to their clients so that their clients can get a better understanding of who they're in business with. Yeah. Um, so that we can really pull out the, um, the storytelling atmosphere out of that individual so that they can really demonstrate what their capacity is as an individual and a business owner. Yeah. So that's, like that's that. what the goal of next level studios is. Um, and to that point, podcasts like this, aim at that direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we've started doing podcasts for other individuals, not with us sitting here, but yeah. those people sitting here in yeah. the studio. Um, and so that's, that's a nice little oh, shot in the cool. arm for, for some quick order. Where, where did that so, come from? Is that you, your wife or me? Yeah. I was sitting down. You can't down. give her any credit for anything. What's that? You can't give her any credit for anything. <laughs> I'm the ideas guy. And and so but she's my sounding board, you know, so I, yeah. I, I throw stuff out there and she bats it around and she pushes it back yeah. and she does a wonderful job of, um, of challenging my ideas, um, which is, which is a fantastic thing. Yeah. It could be frustrating if you looked at it the wrong way, but I look at it as the reason that this contestant or this, this, uh, contesting exists is to sharpen my idea better. Oh, absolutely. And if it's a dumb idea, it's a dumb idea. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. And so um, this time last year, I approached four of our key employees and um, I offered them an opportunity to get in to uh, a, a contributory approach of building a company from the ground up. Um, and it's a, it's a one hand washes the other situation because I'm able to provide some long-term value for them mm -hmm. so that they're, there's more purpose for them to, to grow. Yeah. Right? Cause yeah. real estate is such where there's, there's kind of a glass ceiling installed. Like at some point you can't grow anymore um, gotcha. because you can only get so fast. Mm -hmm. You can only get so good. And there's not a lot of moving and shaking in, in the technology advances in real estate yeah. without, larger competitors, not larger competitors, uh, larger companies coming out with a, a technology item that you then invest in and then implement, right? Because yeah. that's really the only growth. Um, and so as a result, there's not any more vertical movement for a lot of the people that work for me. And that hurts Yeah. because I, I don't want to see our employees be kept at a, at a, at a par level. Um, and I don't want their pay to be strictly tied to what we can do with our prices. I gotcha. want, I want their growth capacity to be unrestrained and how can I do that? And so this is one of the rates. That's ways really to cool of you. Yeah. So, so we offered those, uh, those opportunities to, to four people and, um, started next level from the ground up and, uh, things have been going exceptionally well. So we invested in the studio space. Yeah. You saw our previous place. It yeah. was, it was yeah. really humble beginnings. Um, better than work from home. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, you gotta um, start from somewhere. Yeah, exactly. So, and here we are. And, um, it's all about vertical momentum and what can we, what can we do and why not? Yeah. Right. So that's kind of the way that we approach things. So what's next for me? I don't really know. Uh, you know, just I think personal development, continue reading books, continue to be the best husband and father I can be, um, a good leader for my company, continue building the business. Um, we want to hire a few more electricians, but like any, any place of employment right now to try to find people. It's just, it's, it's difficult. And really? Tough. <laughs> yeah. I don't find that. Oh, we do. Sorry. <laughs> I can't sympathize. Really? No. Wow. I can't you're like the, the only one. Yeah. Oh, to find electricians, you know, it's just, it's just tough. Now, um, when you say electricians, you're not talking about 
apprentices. Not apprentices. Okay. They got to be licensed journeyman yep. electrician. Yeah. So at that point, yeah. that's definitely a narrower market. There's so many apprentices that are approaching us. They, they want jobs, but we we can't hire them unless we have another electrician. So it's it's got like it. the chicken before the egg. Is you know? it a one to one ratio? Yeah, in Massachusetts. Oof. Yeah, that's a wow. problem. You know, so if they bring an electrician, then we could hire them. But yeah, Massachusetts one to one, so it's it's difficult. Wow. You know, and there's a lot of kids that, to be honest, you know, since I've been pushing the trades, there's a lot of kids that like everyone I talk to, like, oh, I want to be an electrician. I want to be an electrician. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, so I don't, but I don't know where find, it's really coming from. But, but they got to find someone to work with. Yeah, that that's the tough part is that there's so many that are retiring and there's just not enough with that ratio to hire the new ones that are coming in. How many years do you have to be an apprentice? Uh, so it's 8,000 hours. So if you started off the street, you know, it's four years. You know, which which has always been something I've talked about where do you do you get a scholarship because of sports, your smarts or mom and dad paid for it and go and have fun for four years in college yeah. or become an electrician or even a plumber? Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of the kids, they choose a the college route. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we are going to see a change in tides here, though. I think it's already you started. Know, I, yeah, I think I think we will because of the cost of college and everything that's going on. But uh, the trades is hard work. You know, we get dirty. We're we're working in the cold. We're yeah. working in sweaty attics. You yep. know, and it doesn't matter what trade. I you know I'm an electrician, but I I speak for all the trades when I talk about it. It's tough, and I I don't know if the next generation of kids is really doing it. Cut for it. You know, yeah. Okay. You know, even my own son. You know, Ed, he doesn't want anything to do with digging a hole or getting dirty or you know, God forbid, his Jordans were creased. You know, so. <laughs> Like, yeah, no, you know, the, that, the, that's the shoe thing, oh, man. you know, that's, yeah. that's our next level. So, yeah. um, you know, and I'm a huge, um, you know, proponent of the trades and, and, you know, always working and, you know, not really getting dirty as much as I used to, but, right. um, you, you think your kids would look up to you, but I think they look up to me on how hard I work, how hard, how, how hard I the work, ethics but they're not going, he's not going to be electrician sure. and I'm not pushing him to be one either, yeah. but I don't know about the next generation. I don't know what they're going to want to do. All right. You know? Well, so it's, time will tell. Yeah. Let's circle back in a year. Yeah. I'd yeah, like we'll to, see. I'd like to have some continued conversations on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. But, well, it's been a, it's been a wonderful conversation. Josh. Yes. Yes. Thank you for having me. This is, this is great. I'm glad that you came in and thanks for the Celsius. Absolutely. Another toast. That's it.